Okay, boys and girls, it is time for Chapter 2 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Remember, we only have one small illustration at the beginning of each chapter, and here he is. That's old Mr. Dudley, grown up looking very, very, I don't know, Dudley-ish with a whole bunch of birthday presents, okay? So the, the title of this chapter is The Vanishing Glass. Hmm. All right. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step. Okay, so timeline. I know you guys have been talking about that. The beginning of the story was ten years ago, and now ten whole years. We've jumped forward ten years. So here he's not a baby anymore. He's how old? About to be ten. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read that sentence again. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step. But Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursley's front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a big, I'm sorry, they said large, not big. I'm messing things up today. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets, but Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby. And now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel, carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet, Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up! Now! Harry woke with a start. Gray's in here listening, boys and girls. He's working on our Harry Potter puzzle. <laughs> he might make an appearance when he walks by, but I don't know. Harry woke up with a start and his aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking toward the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it and he had a funny feeling that he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect for Dudley's birthday. Harry groaned. Oh. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry slowly got out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider off of one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders, because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that is where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall and into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all of Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he'd wanted, and not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless it involved punching someone. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard. Boys and girls, they call a cupboard, it's the same thing as a closet, okay? So you have stairs that go like this, and quite often there will be a closet under the stairs right here right here. I have one under my stairs where I keep my Christmas decorations. That is where Harry was living in a cupboard, aka a closet, under the stairs. Okay. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was, because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face 
knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him in the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he got it. In the car crash when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of eggs and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Aunt Marge's presents, see? And here's this, it's underneath this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right. Thirty-seven, then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger, too, because she said quickly, We'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. Looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39 sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth just like his father. boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. He was ripping the paper off of a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror. <gasps> I did not get a rise out of Gray. I thought I'd, he'd at least smile at me there. <gasps> there was a smile. He was horrified. But Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig a crazy old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled like cabbage and Mrs. Fig made him look at all the photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned all this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself that it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. We could phone March, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this as though he wasn't there, or rather as he was something very nasty that couldn't understand him, like a bug. What about, what's her name? Your friend, Fonny. On vacation in Majorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. I don't think I said that place right, but again, it's a place. She's on vacation there. It's probably pretty cool. Doesn't matter if I said it right. You could just leave me here, Harry said hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. 
Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd just swallowed a lemon. Come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting alone in it. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Duddydums, don't cry. Mummy won't let him spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to, to come, Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here said Aunt Petunia frantically, and a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Piers Polkus, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Piers and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they'd left, Uncle Vernon took Harry aside. I'm warning you, he put his big, large face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you. I'm warning you now, boy, any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now till Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, Harry said honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry when it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of coming back from the barber's looking as though he hadn't been at all, she had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald except for his bangs, which she left to hide that terrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. The next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. He'd been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back that quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's. It was brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but it certainly wasn't going to fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have just shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished for that one. On the other hand, he'd gotten into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual. As much to Harry's surprise as everyone else, there he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, same thing as the principal, telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings, but all he tried to do as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong.